My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm ProPublica's Interim Director of Communications. We're excited to be partnering with GRIST to bring you tonight's event, How White Conservationists Are Changing Life in a Black Farming Town. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Our partner, GRIST, is a nonprofit independent media organization dedicated to telling stories of climate solutions and a just future. This event is built around Tony Briscoe's reporting on Pembroke Township, a historically black community 60 miles south of Chicago that has a proud legacy of farming. But recent controversial land acquisitions by predominantly white conservation groups have imperiled the livelihood of black farmers there. Tonight's event, which is broken into three parts, will address issues related to race, power, and land stewardship. In the first section, ProPublica reporters Tony Briscoe and Lizzie Presser will discuss threats to Black land ownership. In the second section, Tony will moderate a discussion with Pembroke residents and a member of the Field Museum to unpack the dynamics at play in the township. Finally, the third section will be, will be devoted to questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. And now I'll introduce our first speakers. Tony and Lizzie, could you please turn your cameras on? Okay. Tony Briscoe is a reporter for ProPublica. He previously worked at the Chicago Tribune as an environmental reporter. Lizzie Presser is also a reporter for ProPublica where she covers health, inequality, and how policy is experienced. Before I hand it off, I wanna note that this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Thanks again to Gris for partnering with us and thanks to McKinsey and company for their support. I'll let you guys take it from here. Thank you, Connor. Um, Tony, it's great to talk to you about this piece. Um, I wanted to just start by asking how you came to it. What drew you to the story and how did you find it? Yeah, um, you know, we actually came across this story. I, I had actually wasn't really familiar with the Pembroke, um, you know, area before this. Uh, came across this story from a tip, um, you know, uh, from someone who was talking about, you know, um, conservation plans and these plans uh, from uh, folks who are largely outside of Pembroke Township to convert uh, large segments of the community into this network of nature sanctuaries, which outwardly doesn't sound like, you know, anything that would be controversial, but the more that we dug into it, it, it became kind of this very nuanced story. And um, we were really kind of uh, listening to the community and, you know, wanted to um, uh, explore their concerns, which were uh, a lot about the loss of farmland, um, a loss of a way of life and impacts to the tax base. What were the mechanisms that you were finding were most commonly used to acquire land from, from Black landowners in Pembroke? Yeah, I would say like the most controversial, um, you know, part of this story was um, actually the fact that, um, you know, private individuals and uh, conservation groups, most notably the Nature Conservancy, uh, which has some pretty deep pockets, uh, were acquiring land in this financially um, challenged community at tax sale. Um, so in many cases, they were going to these tax auctions. Um, and, you know, um, this is a concern that I think it's been brought up by a lot of folks that black farmers were um, losing land due to these, uh, you know, financial hardships, because, you know, historically, they haven't been able to uh, get access to loans, or they're distrustful of, uh, you know, financial institutions that have really discriminated against them. Um, and you know, um, next thing uh, that happened is, you know, they're, you know, stitching together more and more land, uh, you know, that has been lost by these black farmers or black landowners uh, that had been um, historically discriminated against. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I wanted to, to ask you because I know that you've done a lot of reporting on black land loss and uh, North Carolina as a part of your dispossessed series. And, you know, this, these issues that it, it's like a tangled web sometimes in terms of how, um, you know, um, uh, the loss of black farmland and the, or the lack of, uh, or the loss of uh, black land, uh, how that uh, comes to be. I guess I wondered, you know, what were some of the main drivers of black land loss uh, that you found during your reporting? And I guess, do you see any kind of uh, overlap or similarities with Pembroke? Yeah. 
a lot. And I was, I just, I guess I'd back up and say that I was focusing very specifically on heirs property, which is a, a legal concept that describes land that's been passed down without a will. Um, and it's usually then owned intestate is the legal term, but by uh, the next generation of family members. And it's almost like they own stocks in a company and it makes this kind of land ownership extraordinarily fragile. And it sounded from your story, like you were running across the same thing with families you were meeting. Um, so I was looking at legal ways to essentially take land from people who had heirs property, which is much more common among black Americans than it is among white Americans. I believe it's I think right now it's about 76% of Black Americans in this country don't have a will, which is more than double the number of white Americans. So it continues to be a major problem. And, and much of that is historical, right? It's rooted in uh, Reconstruction and in Jim Crow era laws and in fears of, at least when I was looking at it, of Southern courts and of um, white supremacy in Southern courts. So there was good reason for Black families to avoid making wills and avoid registering their land, um, and they face the consequences today. And so I was looking at adverse possession, uh, which is a way that an heir or someone else can come onto your property and claim that they have been using it continuously and publicly and with hostility and then seize that land. And I was looking at partition sales, which was a way in which just one heir could sell their share to a developer or a land speculator. And then that outsider could force a sale through the courts that families couldn't afford to pay. And it was land that they believed was theirs to begin with. So they didn't also believe they should have to pay. Um, and then I was also looking at tax sales, which you write about um, in Pembroke as well. And as you were saying, these were families who, because they have heirs property, um, weren't necessarily able to access the same kind of financing for their homes that other families who have clear titles can, right? They can't often qualify for HUD loans, um, for house repair loans from the federal government. They can't often um, qualify for FEMA loans if there's been a disaster in their area. Um, so they kind of slowly see the wealth in their property erode without any way to fix it. And tax sales are extremely complicated to, to fight, um, especially if you're an heir's property owner. Sometimes you try to pay and the court will say, you can't pay because you're not listed as an heir and you can't probate that estate. And it, it does, as you say, become this really tangled web. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say, I'm, you know, I'm curious uh, in, in your experience, I mean, how has uh, the loss of black owned land impacted the communities that you reported on in the long run? And also just kind of riffing off of that, I mean, uh, have you seen any kind of initiatives or any kind of efforts uh, that have successfully helped stem this trend? I think I, I saw a number of different long-term impacts and it's impossible to kind of list them all in this short form, but, I mean, just imagine losing your family land. It's it's really, I think, on one level, it's a sense of identity and history for a family, and the loss of land can can break a family apart. It's no longer a place where people can come together for family reunions, where you can all get together for whatever occasion. I'm going actually back down to North Carolina in a couple of weeks for a, for the matriarch's 95th birthday, where she'll have over a hundred relatives coming down to her heir's property for for her birthday, I mean, and that's, it's a tie to your roots in a lot of families. So there's that. I think I was also seeing though that many families who had heirs property had built these local economies of their own. So in an age where, where jobs are increasingly being lost, this is a way to build some, like micro economies. And so I was focused on a family that had taught themselves how to work the water and were and were fishers and crabbers and worked the land too and raised watermelon and tobacco and corn and um that's their heritage and that's also their livelihood and so when they lose access to that they also lose access to financial stability um and then the other piece of it was leisure i must say which was that i was writing about a family that um owned a beachfront and under Jim Crow laws, it was the only black owned beach in the county. And so it was a way 
for people in the county to relax. And when they talk about that land that they no longer have access to, it's like they have lost a sense of freedom in some ways. So those are just three examples, but I could go on and on. But I, I did, I wanted to ask you in reading your article, I was writing about developers who were buying up heirs property. And I wondered how you saw um, the difference when it's conservationists who are buying up heirs property or just land owned by black farmers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting distinction, right? It's, um, you know, uh, in many cases, and I will say this, it's, it's a caveat in there that, you know, conservationists are not the first outside group to buy land in Pembroke or to capitalize on black land loss in Pembroke. Um, there have been generations of outside land speculators, be it folks who are buying land and flipping it for profit or folks, um, you know, larger commercial farmers who have encroached on black land loss. And so uh, this is something that has dwindled down over the years. The main distinction between, um, you know, folks who are buying land and, you know, doing it for you know, maybe business reasons or development reasons or things like that. And, um, you know, conservationists uh, are really the tax breaks, uh, which have been cited by, you know, a number of elected officials representing this area, which are, you know, once um, these conservationists are buying this land and they string to, uh, together enough of this land, they're, um, you know, imposing these land restrictions, which you know, not only, uh, you know, restrict what can be done on this land, uh, in some cases permanently with uh, some activities, uh, but it also entitles them um, in some cases to tax breaks. So it's allowed uh, folks like uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, which, you know, uh, you know, reported uh, more than a billion dollars in their most recent, uh, you know, tax filing to, um, you know, essentially pay less than previous landowners, which in this community, the median household income is $29,000. So you have folks that, you know, are plenty capable of paying taxes uh, that are lowering their tax obligation in a community that has many infrastructure needs. Yeah, it's, it's quite different in some ways. What did you see was at stake in Pembroke as this land is being bought up? You know, I, I would say that it, it's a lot of what, what you found also. I mean, you know, this loss of, I mean, certainly there's, you know, a loss of, you know, generational wealth, with, which is concerning and in a, you know, Black community like Pembroke, um, because obviously it can't be passed down from generation to generation. Uh, but, you know, also it's, it's, you know, owning land there is is more than just having a deed. It's, um, you know, no, understanding the adversity that folks had to go through to obtain this land, um, uh, it really kind of hones in on why, you know, uh, holding on to it, retaining it, passing it down is so special. So, you know, it is a way of life. Like you said, this is a community that really appreciates being able to ride their horses, uh, farming, um, you know, uh, hunting uh, in, in the woods that exist there. Uh, and just enjoying the natural features, which are quite rare in a state like Illinois, where there is so much. And, uh, you know, this is a rare ecologically diverse um, farming community. There, there are a, plenty of these rare uh, sandy oak savannas. And so people really enjoy these natural features. Uh, so it is a way of uh, a loss of a way of life. Uh, in addition to, like you said, the livelihoods that exist, because uh, this is one of the few strongholds for um, you know, black, black farming in Illinois. So. Thank you guys. Uh, this is a great moment to transition to the second part of tonight's event, uh, which will focus on the specific dynamics at play in Pembroke and will feature voices from the community. So allow me to introduce the next round of speakers. Uh, Pam will be joining us by phone, and Pam is a farmer whose family roots in Pembroke span several generations. We also have Sharon and Erica. You guys can go ahead and turn your cameras on. Uh, Sharon, Sharon White is a former supervisor of Pembroke Township, and as supervisor, she joined other local officials to oppose the Fish and Wildlife Surface Nature Refuge proposal. Erica Hassel joined the Field Museum's Keller Science Action Center over 10 years ago. 
They bring their background in both ecology and mapping to the center's work in Pembroke Township and their research on urban monarchy butterfly conservation. Thanks for joining us, Tony. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Connor. Yeah, so, you know, I want to first off, uh, you know, go around by, um, you know, uh, going around to all three panelists uh, and asking you a couple of questions, if that's okay by you. Uh, we'll start with, um, uh, with you, Pam, and then we'll go to Sharon and then Erica. So, you know, first off, I just wanted to know um, if you could just describe for the audience your connection to Pembroke and uh, then also give your thoughts on, you know, how the actions of outside conservationists, uh, in your opinion, affected the community. And we'll start with you, Pam. Pam, are you there? Okay, uh, Sharon, let's go to you. Um, could you sure. describe your connection to Pembroke and, and your thoughts on how the actions of uh, outside conservationists have affected uh, the community in your opinion? Sure, um, I'm a resident of approximately 15 years. Um, I'm a uh, administrator. I work for the state of Illinois at some, some time in my career. And I also, uh, as independent contractor, uh, facilitate grants for the community and other communities. So uh, my initial, uh, my, I'm sorry, my initial uh, working with Pembroke, I uh, was hired as a grant writer for the municipality. And once I realized that the, the problems of Pembroke were uh, institutionalized that I thought I'd be more effective if I became one of the uh, leaders in the community. So I ran for for township supervisor. Uh, I won. And I thought that's where you can make the change at the top. Um, one of the, Pembroke has some, uh, has a dynamic of uh, many different issues that uh, plague them. One of the issues was that uh, Nature Conservancy, when I realized our tax base and I was uh, analyzing where the funds come up, why, why are we lacking some of the resources that some of the other communities have? Mm -hmm. I found that the tax base was very small, but the tax base was getting smaller. So what I did was I looked at who owned the properties. I looked at what the property taxes were. I said, okay. And then I found out that Nature Conservancy was such an intricate part of the community, uh, the community didn't realize. Sharon, you muted yourself. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. How Nature Conservancy has entrenched themselves in the community where the community is way, well uh, unaware of it. Uh, so when Nature Conservancy purchases property in a community like Pembroke, they change the designation of those properties to conservation. And how does that affect the tax base? Well, conservation designations do not pay taxes or they pay very little taxes compared to what it would have been as a homestead. And those properties cannot go back as homesteads. So once the designation is a conservation and, I, and if you wanted to purchase it back from them, you still would have to keep it as a conservation. You could not go back to homestead where the tax base are. And in municipalities, the way municipalities grow is through their tax base, which is property tax. That's where they get their revenue from. So as the revenue diminishes when they purchase the, the property because the low, low or no taxes that they pay, then you start to collapse the community's tax base. You, you collapse the community tax base, the community collapsed. And they've been doing it for over 30, 40 years. At some point, it will collapse to itself because now you don't have the money for the schools, you don't have money for the roads, you don't have money. And then on the water system, the water system will collapse because they were purchasing uh, properties that were designated on the water system for homesteading. So no one actually realized that that was occurring until, or, or if they did, we didn't, they didn't tell the people. And so I, I got uh, a rallied around the people. I put a referendum 
on um, a ballot to say, hey, this is what's happening. Do you want nature conservancy in our community? It was a 90% said no with that ballot. And that was the first time that had ever been done. Uh, the community was asked, what did they want for themselves in a whole, in a, in a generality type way, instead of just flyers. So it was a vote saying, no, we don't want nature conservancy in, in our community because they're not open to uh, tell us what their plans are. So that was yeah. one of the biggest impacts. Yeah, no, I, I remember citing the, the the referendum and, you know, 85% of the community in that case, um, you know, um, the voters that turned out saying that they did not want, uh, you know, um, the Nature Conservancy buying uh, land for, for conservation. Um, and we'll certainly circle back to that a little bit later. Erica, I want to turn to you um, and um, have uh, you uh, discuss uh, your connection to Pembroke and um, your thoughts on conservation there. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Tony. Sharon, it's good to see you. Hi, hi. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, so I, I am not a resident of Pembroke. I work at the Field Museum of Natural History. We're a natural history museum located in Chicago. Uh, and I work in a department called the Keller Science Action Center. And we're a little bit different than uh, a lot of departments that you might expect in a museum. I'm, I'm not a dinosaur or mummy expert. Um, we actually are a mix of folks like myself that have uh, ecological training and knowledge about the local landscape, like my colleagues who are social scientists, anthropologists, um, and educators. And so we came to Pembroke uh, over, we were aware of it for a long time. Pembroke is well known in the, in the Chicago, you know, we're not unassociated with the Chicago conservation world. And we one of the first things, projects that we worked on was actually an exhibit because um, that does sound like something that a museum does. Uh, we were funded to work uh, with folks in the community, including Pam, who I see has joined us, as a co-curator on an exhibit called Rooted, the Richness of Land and Culture that's in the library today. Um, it's been at the school at times. And that was a, a fascinating year of really getting to work with our, both our co-curators in Pembroke and interviewing lots of people in the community. And what came out of that was really being aware of, of people's worries, uh, people's worries about large scale agriculture coming into the community, illegal logging, fly dumping, things like that. But also getting to know people's values, the, what they saw as the assets of the community. I mean, Tony, one of the things I appreciated about the article was that so many things written about Pembroke are written about all the things that Pembroke doesn't have. And not a lot has been written about how great Pembroke is, the assets. And so that is really the center of our approach wherever we work is to focus on the community's assets and building towards the vision that the community has. And so that's what we've tried to do over the process over a number of years. And I think probably the most striking thing to me is through many, many, many interviews with lots of folks in Pembroke that people have a deep value, a deep ethic with the land. And that's borne out by the landscape. Residents of Pembroke have been stewarding that landscape for 150 years and they've done a great job. That's why I can tell you that there's globally important conservation land there. So I think that's really the focus of, of our work as a museum. Thank you for that, Erica. And yeah, no, it it was really helpful uh, when I was first uh, going down to the community to see you guys' as exhibit over at the library there um, and seeing all the, the different soil types and, uh, you know, um, uh, actually Pam's, uh, you know, uh, many um, things that she's made out of uh, natural herbs, berries, and kind of uh, the local traditions and becoming familiar with that. I think we do have Pam now. And uh, Pam, if you're there, uh, I wanted to ask you, we're just kind of going around the room and uh, talking to all the panelists. I mean, could you describe your connection to Pembroke and give us your thoughts on, you know, how the, the actions of outside conservationists have affected the community in your opinion? Oh, I came to Pembroke in 1959. I was eight years old. I worked as a village treasurer, township clerk, uh, deputy assessor for 16 years, and now I'm the current assessor. My father was a farmer, my husband and I are farmers, and now my son is a farmer. We have five generations living in Pembroke Township. And we've always respected the land 
and so does many of our neighbors, most of our neighbors. We are the ones who have conserved this land. The only thing I see them do is, I'm talking about the conservationists, start fires every two years, which I think is a really bad practice because it displaces the, the, the wildlife. Uh, I see these uh, so-called conservationists as land grabbers. The Nature's Conservancy came here to buy land to make sure, and this is a quote, that their children will be able to enjoy it in the future. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, having your, your experience and having, um, you know, uh, someone whose family is, uh, has so much uh, of a connection in the community. Um, and, you know, uh, things I, I would say, um, you know, really kind of came to a head um, in about, I would say, um, 2014, 2015, 2016, around that, that time period where um, there was a lot of uh, things going on. Like I said, there are many different organizations and individuals from the conservation front that were involved in Pembroke. There was uh, the wildlife refuge plan by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There was the Nature Conservancy that had their own plans uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, Erica, I wanted to turn to you and see, you know, uh, could you explain what role the field museum played as these tensions arose between, I guess, these outside conservationists and members of the Pembroke community? And I guess uh, also why the field museum found it so important to intervene? Yeah, I think um, certainly around 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, I wanted to get a shirt printed that said the Field Museum cannot buy land. Um, <laughs> I think that was an important component. Uh, we're not, uh, we literally don't even own the land that the building is on. It's rented from the Chicago Park District. Um, and so we, to some extent, can provide that, um, that neutral role. Uh, at that point, we had been working in the community for a long time, and we had worked through this this assets process, which we use uh, in a lot of places we work. Um, it's developed in part with our work in the Andes Amazon region of South America, uh, which doesn't sound like it's like Pembroke, but it is because it's a place where there's globally important conservation that is where that is stewarded by the people that live there. Um, and so leveraging the assets and the values of the people who've lived on the landscape, in the case of Pembroke, uh, we work with folks and, and literally put them on a map. These are the places, uh, this is the water and sewer line that Sharon talked about. This is where it's located. Um, this is where businesses are. This is where a lot of people's homes are located. And so putting that on a map next to the existing land that was part of the conservation landscape, and providing that is a place to have that discussion. Um, I find that one of the, the things that I, I hope when we're doing our job as well that we do is we speak conservation. That's my training. I went to natural resources school um, and I have colleagues who work with people, they're social scientists. And we also invested deeply in education. Um, one of the things we heard from folks is the importance of, of the school. There's a school in Pembroke, Lorenzo R. Smith technology and um, working with students there, providing experiences for kids to, to grow that next generation of folks that has that conservation ethic. And that was already happening in the community, but being able to provide a resource for those kids, um, is something that we do in Pembroke and something we do in Chicago. Thank you. Um, Pam and Sharon, I wanted to turn back to you because, um, you know, the Nature Conservancy as the largest um, land buyer um, in, in the area there, you know, has talked a lot about being a good neighbor and steps that they've, uh, they have stopped, um, you know, buying uh, parcels of land, uh, they say, on uh, developable uh, parcels along the sewer and water lines, it, you know, uh, places where um, I think uh, village and township officials uh, see as maybe this could be a place where a home is built or, or so on and so forth. Uh, they've also stopped buying a tax sale after that issue was kind of raised. Um, so the last tax sale that they went to was in 2015. Um, I wanted to turn to you all to ask, um, you know, uh, how can outside conservation groups uh, like the Nature Conservancy better work with local communities?
communities, in your opinion? Uh, Pam, can we start with you? And then I'll go to you, Sharon. Okay, uh, first, first of all, they're still buying land in subdivisions. Subdivisions were developed to put housing on. Most of Pembroke Township uh, around the uh, Main Street, uh, maybe the first uh, one, two, three, four, six or seven sections are in subdivision. So it doesn't have to be on, a, on the water and sewer line to be developed. People are on wells. Uh, they uh, have septic tanks. And people ha have lived on some of the land they, that, that the conservation bought. And so they still have wells and septic tanks on it. But what they're, what, what they're doing, they're stopping, they're stopping people from expanding. Like if I had a piece of land next to me and they wanted that land, I couldn't expand. I couldn't buy anything for my, for my children to live on that land. Now, good neighbors don't do that. <laughs> um, what, one of the things that I, I feel like they need to do is get to know the people out there, out here. Uh, educate the people on what they can do to help conserve the land. We've already conserved the land. Better take care of the land. I don't understand why they have to come into an area that's already being conserved and just take it. That's not being a good neighbor. That's not being a neighbor at all. And, and Sharon, um, you actually had uh, the chance to, to sit down with folks uh, during this time period. You're uh, in your capacity as township supervisor. Um, you know, I, I'm curious with you, I guess, uh, did you make any kind of suggestions or, you know, did, uh, what were your thoughts that you wanted to express on how the Nature Conservancy and other groups could be better neighbors? Um, yes, we did meet uh, the mayor, which at the time was Mark Carr, she still is the mayor. We sat down with the county, with the museum, I, that's how I met uh, Erica, uh, Nature Conservancy, the wildlife, and we actually came up with a contractual, like agreed on agreed contractual of, 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 look, if you're gonna purchase land, let us know, don't purchase the land, this is why. And we actually came up with a really good document about what our community needs and how they could integrate in our community. Um, I don't think they adhere to that document now, uh, if it, because of the time uh, has passed and, and those people are not in those capacities anymore. But she, I have to agree with uh, Ms. Pam Basu in that why is it that they feel that they have to save us when we can save ourselves? If there is a uh, conversation that needs to be done, why is it that you can't teach the people? We've been doing a good job because there's no place ever like this in the United States. So obviously we're doing something correct and keeping this place the way it is. So if we needed some enhanced skills, why isn't it they say, hey, this is what you guys need to continue this. Here's the technology or this is what you need, the skill set. Instead of saying, well, we're gonna do it for you because you aren't able to do it. That's an insult to a community and particularly to a community like us when we we have the property and the land is there. So, you know, they didn't come in, you know, when a neighbor comes to you, they knock on your door, they say, here, here's some cookies. Here, we here, we wanna, you know, be friends. That did not happen. They just basically came on your land, even uh, trespassed and said, okay, we know how to keep this better than you uh, and we're going to preserve it. Sorry, yep, you're going to lose it. We'll catch it. And that's how they did. They didn't say, well, how, how do the people keep their property? I mean, they have a lot of resources that they could have shared with us about the conservation. And that's still today. They haven't shared the knowledge of the conservation. It's like, uh, Ms. Basu said they're they're burning because that's part of their conservation. But do they talk to the neighbors? Do they give signs to them? Do they they knock on the neighbors? Say we're gonna burn today. You know we have wildfires. We have a, a volunteer fire department. So you know if a fire goes out wild, wow, then that's an issue for our community. So uh, those kind of things are not that of a friend, and that they don't go to any other neighborhoods to do that, or any other communities. And not not stop at the at the, the 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 ruling bodies and say, hey, this is what we're doing, and can we get your support? They never asked for our support. So that was some of the issues that we had when we were meeting 
that you never knock on our doors. We never got the cookies. Sure. No, thank you. And, and I'd, like to, I'd like to piggy, could, could I piggyback on that? And because I was in the first meeting when they first came here and they told us that they were gonna take this area in a public meeting. And they said they would, they would start off buying from willing sellers and then they would uh, 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 buy from absentee landowners first. And they said, in 20 years, we'll have, no, 40. And, and 40. who is this now, they said, Yeah. They said that 40. they would have the area. Mm -hmm. is, is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that you're referring to? No, the US that would make it Nature Conservancy? Okay. Yeah. No, it was, it, they were all at the table together. Okay, that's true. All sitting together at the table mm -hmm. and told yeah. us they were going to have it. They were going to take this land. Yeah. Neighbor, well, good neighbors don't do that. Well, there was certainly, um, you know, in, in the course of my reporting too, uh, just uh, some interesting relationships between government, uh, you know, um, organizations and, um, you know, private land trust too, uh, which is kind of a side, an aside to that. But it, I did find that uh, interesting as well. Uh, but I, I wanted to turn to Erica because uh, literally um, Pembroke Township became this kind of case study, right? I mean, uh, not only did you guys uh, help develop um, this sustainability plan, but I think Colorado State came out with kind of a, a snapshot or vignette on the tension in the area. I guess I'm, I'm wondering, Erica, I guess what le uh, lessons might have been learned uh, on uh, that might be applicable to other communities, uh, in your opinion? Um, and what, what could have been done uh, better on the part of conservationists? Yeah, I think Sharon, Sharon and Pam said it. Um, the, you know, the, the cookies, the, the engagement is important. And I think one thing that I learned as a, like as a student first studying, you know, my first like conservation course, they were like, this is a crisis discipline. We have to move fast. Things are being lost. And, and that's true. Um, you know, there is not much prairie left here in the prairie state, and, and every time we lose remnant habitat, that's, that's serious. But also, we've learned time and time again in our work, and we've seen it, that it's only successful conservation if the community around you is engaged and supportive. Um, other, it, it's not a successful project if that's not the case. You're not, not everyone's not going to love you forever um, to, to a person, but you need to have the support of the community around you. That's always important and it's particularly important in a place like Pembroke where people have really been stewarding the landscape. One thing that struck me, I, I started my work out, out west um, and when I came to Pembroke, you know, people have fences maybe up by the road, but you get back to the, to the center of the section and, and there's no fence. You don't know whose property you're on. There's, it's a connected landscape, which is an ecologist is an amazing thing. Uh, it's an amazing thing for, for wildlife, but it's also an amazing thing to see that connection that people had. Um, and that's something that was highlighted in this piece. And, and certainly Pam, I think, was one of the first people to talk to me about the importance of being invited to still use the landscape. Uh, to still visit those places, to, to collect as needed, to, to ride horses, a trail network that connected things, that that's really important. And, and that can, that's, that's a slower process um, to develop that with a community, but it's a vitally important one. Uh, so I think it's a bit about pacing. Um, Pam and Sharon, I, I want to turn back to you all um, and kind of bring it up to speed. We've gone through a little bit of the history. Um, and so, you know, uh, as it currently stands, there's uh, more than 2,000 acres of land that are owned by conservationists now in Pembroke Township. Um, you know, there's been limited uh, transparency about the plans from, you know, the Nature Conservancy, but they've given really no indication that they will stop buying land there. Um, the federal government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, has recently released a draft uh, about uh, uh, their funding now uh, and their ability to, to be able to either acquire or protect uh, land uh, in a focus area that includes a large portion of uh, Pembroke Township. I guess I want to just ask uh, you all, starting with Sharon, 
Uh, what do you foresee as the future of Pembroke Township? How do you see all of this shaking out? You know, uh, time stops for no one. Uh, we have actually grown in the community. Uh, we have now in our community, entrenched in our community, Hispanic population. And Hispanic population are rehabbing the homes, they're building homes, and they're putting an anchor into the community where maybe uh, some of the African Americans had displaced or left the community. So I think it's going to be a little more difficult for Nature Conservancy and other organizations like that to get a foothold in our community because there, there are populations now that see the beauty of Pembroke and they're holding on to those properties and they're purchasing the properties and they're making this their home. That, that is one of the things that Nature Conservancy did not want to see happen was that the community become, uh, keep a foothold we're getting natural gas, which will bring businesses and also will bring other families to Pembroke because now you have some of the same resources that you would have in other towns. And so that brings people to live in your communities, just having resources, you know. So those are the things, and Nature Conservancy fought head and nail against uh, natural gas. I was on one of those committees when we met with Night Corp. So you know, they do not want to see the civilization, I would say, to this place because it's harder when you have other people coming from other communities, making roots here. These are educated people, working people. It's hard to bamboozle people who have education and have more knowledge because they come from other communities and they know what type of amenities should be in that community. So they're against anything that's going to be progressive. So I think we, we might be able to save ourselves, actually. Pam, how, how about you? Uh, uh, you know, just with given the the, the landscape and how it's uh, changed, but looking at the current set of circumstances, and um, you know, now the the federal government uh, potentially poised to buy more land, and the Nature Conservancy, um, you know, uh, it seems like their last purchase uh, was in November of 2020. But uh, things like uh, seems like things are still kind of working themselves out. But I guess, what do you foresee as the future of Pembroke Township? Well, uh, the federal government has the money, and if the federal government has their way, we, we'll be just like the Native Americans. I mean, they used to live here. Uh, but I think it's going to be harder, like with the community growing, more people coming into the community, uh, people with money, to, uh, if they buy out, out the land, they're going to have to spend for it now because uh, the Hispanics are outspending the Nature Conservancy, and that's probably why they're not buying as much land. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're yes. running this land up. Yes. I mean, they're overpaying because they know the value of the land and they want a place for their children. And those are the type of people we want out here, people with families. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you know, one of the interesting undercurrents that I found, um, you know, that I, I, I wanted to highlight, even though it was a little bit brief in the article, uh, was the fact that, you know, just turning our attention uh, to um, inclusivity in agriculture, right? Um, you know, there's 27 million acres of uh, farmland in Illinois, and yet less than 19,000 belongs uh, to Black farmers, or uh, less than 19,000 are owned by Black farmers. This is one of the few places um, that, you know, is it, kind of that where that concentration is. I guess I want to, you know, uh, ask, uh, you know, Pam, and, and then also you, Sharon, um, you know, uh, we, we've heard from a state and a federal level um, officials saying that they want to help Black farmers, and yet, you know, various agencies at the state and federal level have also been very supportive of these contra uh, controversial conservation efforts. I guess, what is your vision for, I guess, environmental or agricultural, uh, you know, Oh, I guess, what, what is um, environmental justice look like in black farming towns uh, like Pam? Pam, can, can I ask you that first? Okay, well, my vision or my wish uh, is that black farming towns be treated the same way as white farming towns, that they be respected, they be, uh, that, that, that they get the funding that um, other, other communities get. But uh, right now, I don't see that happening. 
I mean, we do the right thing by protecting and respecting nature, and we get punished. I mean, literally punished for it by having our land and our community taken. I don't see that happening. We have a long way to go. Gotcha. Sharon, um, I know that um, it, it's just a, uh, you know, a bit outside um, Pembroke, but, but you keep horses, I guess. Uh, same mm -hmm. thing for you, I guess, you know, given that there has been this statement of, you know, um, you know, from on the federal and state level to, to help black farmers and ranchers. Uh, what, what is your vision for environmental justice in black farming towns like Pembroke? Um, you know, I, I agree with Pam about the same programs and I know that in the other farming towns that are not African American, they have programs in their schools. You have to you have to create the farmers. The ones who didn't grow up on farms, you have to create those farmers, and you do that through your youth. In those schools, they have the 4-H's, they have all type of agriculture programs. They yeah. are creating the farmers in the grammar schools and the high schools. That's where it begins. I mean, it's difficult to create a farmer who's 30 years old unless that's something they want to do. But and it's, it's known in research that you have to do it while you're young. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're not doing here. We don't have those agriculture programs in our grammar school and in our high schools like they do. We don't have the financing uh, like they do in those schools and, and in the community where the farmers can get financing because, you know, underserved uh, minorities and communities don't have the credit scores and don't have, you know, the same type of, uh, support network for financing to get the small farm and get the little hobby farms. So, I mean, those things need to be put in place before you're going to see growth in any type of underserved community like Pembroke. Or oh, it just won't happen. I mean, you know, to get it in mass, it just won't happen. This is great. Well, I hate to cut you guys short, but I do want to make some time for um, all of our audience questions. Um, we have a ton of great ones from everybody. And Erica, I'd like to start with you. Um, so this comes from a person who they work for a white led conservation organization, and they're wondering, like, what, if anything, they can do um, about coworkers who are reluctant to acknowledge or even learn about their role in maintaining the status quo of conservation culture. Um, Basically, their leaders, they think they're supporting racial equity, but their external, external audiences disagree. Hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, that is a problem in a lot of industries and, con and conservation is definitely one of them. Um, it, it's been documented that, that history and that background and a lot of the even important founders of conservation. And I think one of the, the challenges is I'm going to sound repetitive, but that it's a slow process. Um, it's not something that's fixed in one seminar. It's not something that's fixed with one hire for diversity. It's something that takes time and years and years and is sometimes a slower pace. And if you, if your organization can't have those people in the room because you haven't made those hires, you can't afford those hires, um, then you have to talk to the community where you're working and you have to bring people in and, and sit with them and listen to that. And I think another part of it, and a lot of organizations are doing this, but is investing in these youth programs. Like Sharon was talking about youth programs that train people to work in agriculture. Uh, yeah, most people don't decide to make a mid-career change in their 30s and take a massive pay cut to work in conservation. Um, <laughs> something you have to do from when you're young. And we have to support people at those key transitions in their career. So like when you're going from high school to college and then that first job out of college, those internships in college that give you those connections. So it's not just doing something with little kids, um, but that's really fun and everyone should do it. And actually that's happening in Pembroke. There's this Youth Conservation Corps program um, for high school age youth to work in conservation and build some of those, like even if they don't go into conservation, build some of those like resume skills, those like having difficult conversations with adult skills um, that are important for, for all of our work. Thank you. Um, also, just want to reiterate to all of you uh, that if you just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can type your questions to us. Um, Pam and Sharon, I think this would be a good one for you. Uh, this is another person who works for a conservation organization. Um, 
they're they're the largest landowner in their state and they're in the process of uh, acquiring more and they're grappling with how to do this in a culturally responsible way they ask like is this even possible are there any suggestions that you could recommend or pitfalls we could avoid hmm. uh well well i you know the answer to that i i think we go back to <laughs> Did you did you knock on the doors and give the cookies, <laughs> you know, to the, I mean, you won't know your neighbors unless you go to the door and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Okay. Are there some issues you have with us? What can we do to make this happen? You know, just, you know, you just talk to people. You may not get the response you want, but you get a response and it's up to you to try to work it out, you know, and I, I mean, that would be the first step. I would say, is the, the, give them the cookies. And and I think, well, I don't, I don't think that's the first step. I think the first step is to examine your intentions. What do you intend to do mm. for or to this community? Why are you there? Because that's the question we've been asking mm. all these years. Why are they here? So why are they there? Mm. So. If I can add to what Pam said, it, yeah, it's looking at the assets that the community feels that they have. I, mean, I know as a conservationist, I'm like, okay, where are the most oak trees? I, I value that. And that's, that's important to me. But it's also important to me, like, what, what is the community value? In Pembroke, actually, they also value the oak trees. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, understanding what people in the community value and, and can you bring something to that? Can through your uh -huh. conservation work. I mean, I've sat with many, many people in a room and asked them about their values. And mm. many, I think sometimes we think that, oh, people don't care about nature. People do care about nature. They also need things to live, like jobs and, yes. and roads and futures for their kids. And so making your conservation work part of that is incredibly important. Um, and I think sometimes we feel like we got to be a little sneaky squirrel and go in so that like land prices are good or something. Um, and that that's important because conservation budgets aren't infinite, but it's, it doesn't work if it makes people angry at you. Can I say one more thing um, about the conservation? I, I just think it's amazing that conservationists and people are like come to communities like the Pembroke and just assume that we don't like nature. We're here because of nature. I mean, you can live in a city or you can live in a rural area. People choose your rural areas probably 90% of the time because they like nature, because that's what's here. So I think there's a lot of assumptions that uh, we don't appreciate nature. We don't like the birds. We don't like, I, I just thought that was kind of amazing just to even have a conversation like, well, we're here to save the nature because you guys not really liking nature. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of an insult in a lot of communities. And they feel that when you someone comes knocking on the door saying, we're conservation, we're going to conserve the property that you, you're living on for five generations. You know, just the... Or, or, uh, or that, that we're here because we're stuck here and we have no other place to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're here yeah, because we knows. want to be here. Exactly. That's every community in the rural areas. I've never met a rural area person that did not want to be there if they're there. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. So so okay. I just thought that was a, a few, Yeah. A few people asked, um, uh, were curious to know, like, why the Nature Conservancy went to Pembroke to begin with. Like, what did they see that was valuable there? And Tony, perhaps you could speak to, um, uh, yeah, like, why, why did they choose Pembroke? <laughs> Well, you know, plans uh, were beginning to be drafted um, for a large scale national wildlife refuge by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, I think in the late 90s. And so the, um, the Nature Conservancy was actually a partner on that because they had 7,000 some odd acres across the border in Indiana. Um, and so the idea was to merge these kind of two areas to make a by uh, state, you know, um, you know, collective uh, national wildlife refuge and conservation area, uh, both with 
public and private land. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nature Conservancy would be working in tandem. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, public pushback. Uh, an Indiana congressman uh, then in turn ended up blocking, you know, federal funding for this. Uh, and then without public announcement, um, you know, the Nature Conservancy began buying land uh, shortly thereafter in Pembroke. Um, and I, from what I understand, just from talking with other conservationists, is that, you know, there were other wildlife surveys, both at the state level, and then there were, you know, there was the federal, you know, wildlife, you know, refuge scope uh, that, you know, some folks, you know, quite literally said that they were using as a template to, to find where the um, highest quality, uh, you know, um, natural habitats there, what, uh, you know, in their opinion, um, has the highest quality uh, sandy oak savannas that are in need of protection, which are very rare in the state of Illinois. And so it is my belief that, you know, these state surveys kind of served as a template for high priority areas for the Nature Conservancy. Yes, that's true. Um, and then we started this, uh, this event talking about uh, different threats to black land ownership. And um, one, one listener asks, uh, you know, I was wondering if, you know, uh, maybe a larger problem here is um, a corporation, like corporate farms moving in and buying up land. And I was wondering if, um, yeah, Tony, if you came across this in your reporting or if Pam and Sharon, you could speak to this, like um, if we're if we're weighing the threats like of conservation versus, you know, these corporate farms, like how, how do those compare against each other? I think Pam might know more about the farm. I, 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 they don't, they really, they don't compare, uh, they really don't compare because the, the, the farmers, um, they create a product. I mean, they pay low taxes and the conservation pay low taxes, but they actually create a, they create a, create a project, a, pro, um, a product, sorry. Um, and um, now my taxes are at the same rate as the corporate farmers. Corporate farmers, um, just, just a little history. The corporate farmers used to own the land that we're on. And they sold it to Black people because they couldn't, couldn't farm it. They, they thought it was worthless. So that's how we got the land. So some of the land, I mean, as we started working the land and growing the crops, the, the kinds of crops that we grew, it enriched the land. Now they, they're just trying to get it back. That's, that's what I'm seeing. Mm hmm I, I'll just That's piggyback on those comments by, by Pam by saying the reason that we wrote the story the way, in, in, in the way that we did was because, um, you know, private conservationists and the federal government really had the intentions of buying up thousands of acres of land. I don't think that there are any commercial farmers that have come out and said, hey, we want to bar, buy up large segments of, of Pembroke Township. Uh, the thing yeah. is that uh, over the decades, um, certainly as as I mentioned at the uh, at the top of the um, of the show, that you know uh, they have um, commercial farmers and real estate speculators encroached on black land uh, in the same way. Um, I think that the kind of counter argument, not to lend them any kind of credence, is that they still pay taxes. And like Pam says, uh, in the case of commercial farmers, maybe they create jobs, maybe they they, they um, produce a revenue or a product, um, it's, it, it becomes more of a, t a tax issue. But the thing is, is that, you know, these um, private conservationists in some, you know, standpoints are also uh, consider themselves charities. So I guess, you know, um, if they're buying it, you know, things like tax sale, um, you know, that, that also raises another, um, you know, ethical dilemma. Is, is it okay for, you know, um, commercial farmers or real estate speculators to do it? Is that also okay for, a charity to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, but I think that the, the the large farmers when they buy land and I, I'm look I look at the deeds they usually buy something that's adjourning them you know next to them so they're buying for expansion to expand their farm just like when I buy property I buy property for expansion if I can get it mm. for my property I think Sharon you've done the same thing you bought property for expansion. Yeah. And, and, you know, truthfully, a lot of the farmers, when I was a township supervisor, they, they helped mow the grass. You know what? They cleared the ditches. 
you know, mm-hmm. they, they've always worked with the community. Uh, Holster and all of them, they, they never was outside of the community, even though they were big enough to be considered corporate. Uh, and they just enhance the community. And like you said, they do they do hire, they they donate money for mm-hmm. groups for the kids and that kind of thing. And, and, so and they're they, part of the community. They're not doing something that's trying to hurt the community. They came to a lot of the meetings with Nathan, what we had mm-hmm. with the Field Museum to see what was going on. So, you know, I think they're a different animal. Yes, they are purchasing some lands, like I said, to increase, but actually they probably have to start decreasing some of their their uh, agriculture processing in, in Pembroke. Um, so, you know what? That is another fight. That's not the fight of, you know, where we're concerned about nature conservancy because they pass those farms over to their kids who want it. And then if, if you come to approach them and say, hey, you're not going to farm anymore. Can we buy some of the property? They, they talk to you. You know, it's not the same as someone just coming and purchasing and have a plan where you don't know what the plan is. Uh, and if the plan is to uh, basically genocide your community. And, and that is the word, because that's what's going to happen. And that has been happening to our community. And, um, and, and, and then it's it just that's the way it is. And and then um, the the small farmers here on a first name basis with most of the the, the corporate farmers. That's correct. But in all that's fair, correct. but in all fairness, they do get all the funding. So yeah. They well, should. we're we're about at our time, but I just want to uh, conclude with one question. Um, so at ProPublica, we're all about accountability. And one one reader asks, uh, you know. Do you have do any of you have any ideas on like how you might begin to hold the nature conservancy and others like them accountable? And I'd be curious, you know, feel free to chime in, whoever. Mm. Well, um, I, I think I think what they do, they, they say that the uh, 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 they're focusing on the black farmers and um, but I think that they they say what they think that people want to hear. I don't think you can hold them accountable. Because as long as the federal government is backing them, I really don't think we yeah. can. Yeah. For what they do or what they promise to do and don't do. I have to agree with Pam. I mean, they they say those things, but they know that they have the government, federal government behind them. So actually, their power is is unbound. That right. there's nothing they can't do. Who's who's has to stick to say I'm tell them no you can't do it the only one who could do that would be the federal government and the federal government is saying go ahead and do it so you know Mm -hmm. that that that's the bully he he, you know he's not going to be punished (laughs) great well that's a great oh sorry i i was gonna say i mean i think it's uh i think this is a story about moving slow and building something that's different than what other conservation groups look, what other conservation landscapes look like. I mean, we've spent the last year working with landowners to build a plan for what does it look like in 50 years when you to keep your land, to mm-hmm. stay on the land. What does that generational change look like that Lizzie talked about in, his, in her article? How does land stay in the family if that's the goal for the next generation and continue that ethic of conservation you know, I don't, I don't like the dichotomy between Pembroke residents and conservationists because Pembroke residents have been conservationists for a long time, and I see that ethic in in the community all the time. So it's really about building a landscape that cares about the the birds, the wildlife, and the people that live there. That's what mm-hmm. that's what everyone on this call has talked about doing. So how does that get built going forward, no matter who the players are on the landscape? I think that what needs to be conserved is the culture of Pembroke and the people of Pembroke. I think that's important mm-hmm. because the, the reason this community is the way it is because the people live with nature, mm-hmm. not outside. We're not outsiders. We live here with nature. Well, that's a great place to end. Um, 
I want to uh, thank you all so much for this uh, really wonderful conversation. Thank you, Tony, Lizzie, Pam, Sharon, and Erica. Thank it's you. a very nuanced comp uh, concert, uh, conversation about a complex story, uh, and I appreciate all of your um, thoughtful responses. I um, mm. also want to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, and finally, thanks to Grist for partnering with us and to McKinsey and Company for their support. Um, so again, a recording of this event will be sent to everyone who registered. Um, and from all of us at ProPublica, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.